Hello, welcome uh, to our midweek Bible study um, with um, Mount Beulah Baptist Church this Wednesday, October 21st, uh, 2020. Um, I am very thankful that you guys are continuing to join with me um, through YouTube and checking out our midweek Bible studies. Um, we are continuing in the book of Zechariah. So if you have your Bible with me, if you'll take your Bible and turn to Zechariah uh, chapter 6 is where we are um, this week in our midweek study. And so let me, let me try to bring us up to date real quick where we are and, and make sure that we um, sort of remember some of the stages that we have gone through. Um, as Zechariah opens up this um, revelation, um, in chapter 1 it begins with him preaching a message of repentance a call to repentance for the remnant, about 50,000 Jews that return to Jerusalem. Um, they are there to um, rebuild Jerusalem, uh, that of the temple, a place of worship, that of um, their former glory that Jerusalem had. And in that process, um, they sort of got off course and they have repented that they would uh, make worship and the Lord Jehovah priority in their lives. Um, after that, Zechariah receives eight visions in one night. Um, I started out this series of visions discussing a sleepless night. Um, and in that sleeplessness, um, I've often considered how parents deal with sleepless nights with young children, um, that of infants um, or babies that may be crying throughout the night or trying to get them settled or um, even with colic and just the movement that would disturb the baby or the infant. Um, that of toddlers that uh, will keep parents up, um, trying to get them transitioned maybe from a crib to a toddler bed and, and then you hear um, footsteps coming across a wood floor that they're back out of their bed. Um, we, we've experienced those, uh, my wife and I have experienced those settings for sure. Um, and, and then there's other types of sleepless nights that you may have gone through. Um, those of, of just physical ailment. Um, I know right now we are praying for one of our local pastors as he has had total knee replacement surgery and, and he is recovering from that and the recovery is bringing him a lot of pain and some sleepless nights. Um, and you may have been in a situation that you've been in a pain setting that has brought you sleepless nights. And we understand that. But um, the other side of that is maybe an emotional stress that has brought you to a sleepless aspect. Um, I, I sort of engage the idea of children, young children, infants causing you sleepless night, but teenagers um, can do the same. Um, young adults can do the same. Um, maybe that wayward or prodigal child um, would bring sleepless nights to um, parents. And then um, I, I know grandparents that have sleepless nights because of not only their children, but their grandchildren. And, and so when I even bring up the idea of a sleepless night, I am reminded of the TV commercial that is out there, and I'm not going to name the mattress company that, that acknowledges this or puts this out there, but there's a mattress company that has a slogan that says this, we can't promise you a better night's sleep, but we can prove it. Um, we can prove it. And so, um, so there you go. Maybe, maybe you have a, um, one of these devices, some types of Fitbits or Apple Watches or um, some type that you can wear and it tells you how well you slept at night and it gives you a number. Um, well, that really just depends on what you ate the night before for supper and maybe um, how exhausted you were or maybe... Um, what kind of mentality you had going to bed. And, and so all those things would affect your sleep. And I'm highly aware of that. And so we come to Zechariah and allow us to consider um, 
visions, revelations he has received during this one night of sleeplessness is how I have described this. Um, the culmination of this, we come to the eighth time that Zechariah has been awoken to be given a revelation. And that is here in chapter number six. Now, let me say this um, as we get ready to dive into this. Um, each of these revelations that he has woken up to are not revelations that have been scary or are nightmares or are disturbing. As a matter of fact, every one of these revelations brings him to a point of encouragement that he is going to get to share with the remnant, with those 50,000 people and growing um, there in Jerusalem and in the area of Jerusalem. So this is an amazing night of encouragement that he is going to be able to share with God's chosen people. So if you will check out with me, uh, chapter six, beginning with verse number one, the Bible says, I turned and lifted up my eyes and looked and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains and the mountains were mountains of brass. In the first chariot, there were red horses. In the second chariot, black horses. In the third chariot, white horses. And the fourth chariot, grizzled or mottled, um, M-O-T-T-L-E-D is another word for that, um, and bay horses or strong horses. Then I answered and said to the angel that talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said to me, these are the four spirits of the heavens which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. The black horses which are therein go forth in the north country and the white go forth after them. Uh, the grizzled go forth toward the south country and the bay or the strong, they went forth. They sought to go that they might walk to and fro through the earth. And he said, Get ye hence, walk to and fro through the earth. So they walked to and fro through the earth. Verse 8, Then cried he upon me, and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. Um, we're going to pause right there and consider the eighth um, revelation uh, that he receives and um, try to make an understanding of this for Zechariah. As I stated earlier, each of these revelations have been words of encouragement. And because they are words of encouragement, we again get an eighth setting that is also another word of encouragement. So uh, allow us to consider what he sees. He describes the vision of four chariots. Um, and in these four chariots, they have um, are being led by different colored horses. Um, and the scripture will describe these four chariots as the four winds. Um, and they are going to and fro in the earth. So let me, let me sort of put all that together and say that um, what we have is a picture of of angels, God's servants, um, in chariots, evidently, led by horses to carry out God's messages or commands as God dictates to them. And so um, the interesting thing is we start off here with two mountains of brass. Now, I, I will say this. There is no place in Israel, in Jerusalem, um, that there are mountains of brass um, there, there's no bronze mountains there. Um, I know the dome there um, has that appearance, but not a mountain and not two of them by any means. And so the idea of this brass or bronze being used in scripture usually relates to that of judgment. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, um, if we consider the bronze altar in the tabernacle, it is a period of sacrifice for sin and the judgment of sin is this blood sacrifice that is offered on this bronze altar. Um, if we consider on the life of Moses in the wilderness, um, there was a outpouring of deadly snakes. People were dying and he crafted, molded a bronze serpent. He put it on a pole and said anybody that will look to that 
um, they will be um, able to be saved from their death. Um, obviously a beautiful uh, picture of that of Jesus Christ going on to a cross that if we would look and believe and accept Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, then we would be saved and we would have eternal life and not eternal death. Um, also, if we, we jump forward, I know those were jumping backwards. If we jump forward and we come to the book of Revelation, it does acknowledge um, a picture of Jesus having bronze feet in the aspect of judgment again in Revelation chapter 1. And so um, to bring all that in perspective, uh, this vision really is going to announce a judgment that is coming and Zechariah is getting a, a picture of this. He's getting this revealed to him that there is judgment that's coming. And so um, it, it comes back and gives us these four chariots with these four different colored horses. Now, to be quite honest, in this passage of Scripture, it does not dictate what these horses represent. If we are to jump forward into the book of Revelation, um, as John receives this revelation from the Lord um, there, he does write what some of those horse colors might represent. Um, that of the red horse would be that of war. That of the black horse would be that of death and famine. Um, that of the white horse would be that of a conquering or a conquest that would come. Um, and then we have this, as far as the King James Version says, is grizzled um, or mottled, M-O-T-T-L-E-D, or spotted. Um, there even goes on to a translation that would say it is a marble colored um, horse. So a mixed colors of this horse or um, spotted or, or whatever color you would want to try to put with it. Um, and, and so there's a fourth type. Uh, the colors do not seem to uh, be a huge deal in this. Now, I um, please just take it for what's worth. Uh, we've just got a bunch of colored horses that are being acknowledged here. The four winds of heaven are acknowledged um, in verse 5 as the spirits of heaven, um, that of the angels that are working um, constantly in God's word. And, and so he acknowledges that and gives not only the description, but he gives the direction of the horses. Uh, where do they go? Uh, verse 6 says the black horses, they go to the north, and the white goes after them. Um, and then the, the grizzled uh, goes toward the south country. And the strong, well, they went forth out, walking to and fro in the earth. And so the north country is that of Babylon. This is the place of the captivity. Uh, Babylon, at this point, um, is considering very future in what he is seeing. Now, his vision is going to lead us even into our future. His vision is actually giving us a picture of a military conquest, not only of death, but that of the white horse um, going forth as well in verse 6 to the north country, um, that of conquest and conquering if we want to compare it to Revelation 6. And so here's what we have that is going to um, destroy and conquer um, the north country, which is Babylon. Um, and then there is a horse color that moves toward um, that of the south country. And, and that is um, seen as going toward Egypt. Now, um, why these two particular areas? Well, um, the north and the south, the, the north of Babylon, actually controlled um, a vast area from um, Jerusalem. And really, it would not only be the north, but they would also control that of the east. And so they would wrap around that of Jerusalem um, from the Dead Sea um, all the way up the Jordan River to the Sea of Galilee and northward would Babylon have control. And then below Jerusalem, uh, the country would be that of Egypt. And of course, if you were to go west, you would be at the Mediterranean Sea. And so for all intents and purposes, 
The Lord says, you know what? I am going to um, take and send this military force of my angels in chariots led by horses to go and, and carry out my command. So what happens as these four horses, uh, these four winds, these four spirits of heaven move in this direction? Well, destruction happens. Look with me in verse number eight, the last verse of what we read through this period. Uh, verse eight, it says, Then cried he upon me and spake unto me, saying, Behold, these that go toward the north country have quieted my spirit in the north country. Um, when is God's spirit at peace? Well, this is going to be the conclusion of the tribulation period. Um, I believe this, this tribulation, the, the, these angels are going to carry out God's commands. If we consider um, Revelation as we study that, um, we see that there is going to be great uh, turmoil, great devastation, great famine, um, and great death will happen. And the Bible says that God's spirit will be quieted. For that to happen, um, it's going to have to come to a point in time where Jesus um, will then um, come to reign. It would be that of the millennial kingdom. It would be that after the tribulation and that Jesus would come and sit on a throne to take control. Now, um, Zechariah doesn't get that in this vision. What he gets in this vision that God is going to be at total peace. Can you imagine God looking on earth and being at peace? Um, since sin entered into the world, the Garden of Eden, um, world, the earth has not been at peace. Since Lucifer in heaven revolted against God, um, the heavens have not been at peace. Um, yes, um, God's still in control, and yes, two-thirds of the angels chose to follow him, and, and, but as far as God's spirit being at peace, here he gives this vision to Zechariah that his spirit would be quieted. There would be a calmness that comes upon his spirit. Now, this concludes the visions or the revelations that he has revealed to him in this um, sleepless night. So what happens? God's spirit is at peace. We come to a period of time that um, the temple has been you know, promised to be rebuilt by Zerubbabel who started it. Uh, Joshua, the high priest, is there. Those two men are um, highly involved as the Holy Spirit works through their lives to provide a new light to Jerusalem of God's people um, to invest in them, that, that picture, that image we saw. Um, and then um, we come to um, what happens in this next um, revealing. God just comes to Zechariah again and he's going to continue to come to him. Um, but after Zechariah gets those, those eight visions presented to him, um, we come to something that Zechariah is told to do, which is quite interesting. As we move from the culmination of encouragement of all this restlessness um, to uh, that of verse number 9. Look with me in verses 9 through 15 as we consider what happens after the announcement that Babylon and Egypt would uh, see destruction and that peace would be calmness, quietness would be brought before God. Uh, look with me in verse number nine. The word of the Lord came unto me, or Zechariah, saying, Take of them of the captivity, even Heldai and Tobijah and Jediah, um, which are come from Babylon, um, and come thou the same day and go to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Here's what I want you to do. Verse 11, I want you to take silver and gold and make crowns. Set them upon the head of Joshua, uh, the son of Josedek, the high priest. Now, this is Joshua who we've talked about before. Speak unto him, unto Joshua, saying, verse 12, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, 
He shall grow up out of this place. He shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory. And he shall sit and rule upon a throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. The crowns shall be to Helam and the Tobijah and to Jediah and to Hen, the son of Zephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. Verse 15. They that are far off shall come, they build the temple of the Lord. You shall know the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you, and this shall come to pass if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord. Allow me to consider Zechariah's mission. Um, he, he now has to confront some men that have traveled from Babylon um, to bring, bring money, financing, to help with the rebuilding efforts. Now, uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful thing that is happening. Uh, there are Jews, there are believers, such as even Daniel that's still in Babylon did not come back with the remnant. Um, they are there collecting money, finances, gold, silver, and they have sent this gold and silver to Jerusalem to help them in the rebuilding process. Now, um, I, I guess the best way I can, I can put this would be in our history of uh, a reconstruction period of time. Um, if we go to war and we cause, uh, U.S., cause uh, damage in a country that um, was innocent damage, we as a country um, feel indebted to help reconstruct or rebuild that area. Um, we have seen that happen in the Middle East over the course of the last 20 years. Um, there's no telling how much money the United States has put in, not counting military force and people that have invested to try to help rebuild and set up a democracy um, in the Middle East area. Um, and so this is, this is what we have. We have men traveling from Jerusalem, to Jerusalem from Babylon with money. And, and Zechariah just comes out and he has to confront these men. He says, okay, guys, I know that you have come to help us. The money is great. You're trying to help finance, rebuild the temple. I appreciate that, but here, here's the deal. God told me to take your money, your silver and gold, and to form some crowns. How would you respond to that? Um, these men were commissioned to help rebuild the temple. The priest, the prophet, uh, excuse me, the prophet of the Lord comes and says, I need that money. I need to um, make some crowns. And they gave him the money. Um, it is one thing to obey the word of the Lord. It is another thing to trust God's servant and trust God's man. And to this point, Zechariah has done nothing to lose the trust of his people. Actually, um, he has done everything to gain their trust. And God is blessing him in his ministry as it continues on. And so these men say, okay, here you are. You can have it. And he takes the gold and silver and he fashions what the King James Version says, crowns, but um, appears to be one crown with maybe multiple facets to it that would give the idea of multiple crowns. Um, now, I, I don't know what it looked like. We don't have a description of it other than, uh, there you go. Now, he could have made multiple crowns, and that's fine, but the context is going to lead us to one crown, and, and we'll see that. So he gets this, and he makes this one crown, and so he goes um, in, in verse number um, 11. He takes it, he makes crowns, and he sets them upon the head of Joshua, uh, the high priest, now, I've mentioned Joshua time and time again. Joshua stood before Satan accusing him. Joshua was guilty of not leading proper worship. God says, you know what? Take your hands off my man. Um, I am going to cleanse him. I'm going to put him in white garments. I'm going to put a white turban on his head. He is going to be purified, and he is going to lead worship in the way that I have called him to lead worship. And the truth of the matter is he was stained with filthy sins and filthy rags and guilty. And God says, you know what? No more. So he crowns Joshua with a crown. But then he says, okay, Joshua, you need to understand what's going to happen. Verse 12. Behold, 
the man whose name is the branch, all capital letters, King James Version, should be something similar to that in a version you might have. He is talking about Jesus Christ. Here, here's what's going to happen. He's going to grow up out of this place. Did, did Jesus grow up out of Jerusalem? Yes. Um, it was Jerusalem where he was taken to, um, from Bethlehem to be circumcised or to be acknowledged his name. Um, so he grew up out of Jerusalem. Um, he, uh, from that point, he is going to build the temple of the Lord. What's the temple of the Lord? It's the future temple that is going to be built. He's going to bear the glory of that. Absolutely. People are going to come and see him and his glory. He's going to sit and rule upon the throne. He is going to be a king during the period of the millennium. A thousand years he is going to reign. And not only that, he will be priest as he sits upon the throne. He is going to be king and priest. And he shall counsel peace to the people. He is going to be king and priest and bring peace. Now, the crown was made, the crown was put on Joshua's head, but it was symbolic. It was not for Joshua to be priest and king. They already had a governor. Uh, Zerubbabel was already governor. Joshua was already priest. He was not to do both of those settings and Zerubbabel was governor or king. And so Jesus is going to come and do both. So this symbolic crown is built, constructed, placed on Joshua's head, then taken off his head. Verse 14, the crowns uh, shall be that these men, um, Helam and Tobijah and Jediah and Hen, the son of Zephaniah, they shall be for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. We're going to take these crowns, and if there were multiple crowns or if there was one crown with multiple facets, we're going to take this and we're going to put it in the temple as a memorial for the Lord. We are going to remember this point in biblical time that will be seen in the future. Let me say this. It is not the first time that something was placed in the temple or the tabernacle to be hidden or kept as a memorial. If we go back to the life of David, David, after he kills Goliath, uh, the stone does not kill Goliath. Permanently, <laughs> David goes up, takes Goliath's sword, chops his head off. That kills Goliath. And everybody sees that. Um, in that process, that sword is kept in the temple for years. And then later, David is going to be in need of a weapon and he is going to acquire that sword for himself to use in battle. So it's not the first time something's been done, but it will be the first time this is in memory or memorial for something that will happen. Verse 15, they that are far off shall come and build the temple for the Lord. Um, so in our culture, as this temple will eventually re be rebuilt, it will not be just those um, architecture designs or engineers just there in Jerusalem. It will be other people that will be influenced in the building of this futuristic temple. Um, and you shall know that this has happened and it will come to pass if, if you will diligently Obey the voice of the Lord. Zechariah, here's the deal. Um, you need to understand if you will obey my words, if you will obey my voice, you will see that this is true. This will come to pass. Can you imagine for a moment Zechariah not only getting the eight revealing settings in his nighttime visions, but then coming to a point of going and making this crown or crowns and saying, guys, one day the Messiah is coming. One day Jesus himself is coming. One day this branch is going to come and is going to rule on the throne. And it's not going to take a king and a priest. He's going to handle it all. We're going to be living in peace. If you obey the words of the Lord. You know, as, as believers, it is accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior and then living a life for him. I trust that you'll be encouraged about the future that God has in store for us, a future that will quiet his spirit 
And I promise you this, if the Spirit of God is quieted, um, we as believers will be able to not only enjoy, but we will be able to live at total peace in our future with Him. May God bless you. Thank you for tuning in with us, watching our midweek Bible study here at Mount Beulah Baptist Church.